Hello and welcome to this week's Disability Policy Webinar Series. I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items before we get started. If we can move to the next slide. OK, if you look in the upper right hand corner of your screen, you should see an orange arrow and that's your go to webinar control panel. Um, if you join via the app on your phone, you're going to find that either at the top or bottom of your screen. If you have an issue with your audio during this presentation, you're going to want to go into that go to webinar control panel and do the mic and speaker sound check. Participants are muted for this presentation, but you can type your questions or comments into the go to webinar um, question window within your control panel. A link to the handouts is shared in the control panel. You just look for the tab that's called handouts. If you lose your go to webinar screen at any time, you're going to want to look for the blue flower icon in your taskbar. Hi, Kathy. Are you on? Hi, Sherry. Hi. I just want to um, welcome everyone today to our second of four public policy seminar informational sessions. Today we have someone speaking on my able, um, and I'm going to turn that over to Kathy McRae, and she's going to formally introduce our speaker. Thank you, and enjoy the session. Hey, good morning, everybody. So I'm Kathy McRae, and I work for the ARC Michigan. Most of the work that I do for the ARC uh, as a program coordinator revolves around um, employment, benefits planning, and financial stability and security, which is why I'm so excited about today's topic. Um, the My Able program is a huge piece of that financial stability and security. And why I'm so excited to introduce our guest speaker today, um, Scott DeVarona. Scott has worked for the state of Michigan since uh, 2000, so he has a number of years in of experience. And since 2015, he has been the division director for My Able and the Student Loan Repayment Program uh, Division in the state of Michigan. Um, he has uh, served as the My Able Director within the Office of Post-Secondary Financial Planning, and he oversees the Michigan Guarantee Agency and the state's Student Loan Programs Office, in addition to the My Able 529 program. So, I, without further ado, I hope that you will all welcome Scott DeVarona. Scott, take it away. Thanks, Kathy. Hello, everyone. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the ARC for uh, for inviting me to do this webinar. Um, obviously, in the, the past 14, 16 months, uh, it's been impossible for me to get out on the road and spend time with people talking about the ABLE program. Um, so I'm really thankful for this opportunity to virtually meet all of you and explain to you the ABLE program and how it can help you, your clients, and or your families. Today we're going to talk about the ABLE Act and its features. Um, how did it come about? Why did it come about? What can it do for you? I'm going to talk nationally what all ABLE accounts feature. Um, it is a program that was uh, designated by the IRS and the Social Security Administration. Um, and there are some rules associated to those uh, programs. I will also obviously talk a lot about the Michigan program, uh, what it can do for Michigan residents specifically. I will also do a brief demonstration about how one would enroll in our My Able program so that you can actually see the screens and get a feel for what it's going to look like when and if you are ready to uh, create an account and, uh, and, and start using the ABLE program. I always leave time at the end for questions and answers. Um, I believe that there's a chat function where you can type your questions in and we will get to all of them at the end. Um, you should all already have access to this PowerPoint, so if you uh, want it in the future or if you have questions about a particular slide, you can always go back to it. All of the information that I'm going to be going over today is available on our website, which is www.myable.org. 
Uh, in addition to the PowerPoint that you're that you're looking at, we also have webinars, we have frequently asked questions, and um, all of our uh, program documentation is available on our website for you to peruse at your leisure. So let's talk a little bit about the ABLE Act and its history. How did it come about? Why did it come about? What can it do for you? The ABLE Act was passed in December of 2014 to overwhelming congressional support. And I don't know if any of you follow Congress, but this was one of those things that everyone agreed on. Republicans, Democrats, um, the older members of Congress, the younger members of Congress, men, women, everyone agreed that this was a great idea because for far too long, we have told individuals with disabilities, stay broke. Don't ever have more than $2,000 in assets or you're gonna lose your benefits and they didn't have a good way to make modifications to that so they came around with the ABLE Act. When the ADA was passed 30 years ago everybody was current concerned with accessibility ensuring that people with disabilities had access to schools and museums and libraries and, and things of that nature public places and we've done a really good job of ensuring that people with disabilities have access to those places but the second part of the ADA that was passed, again, 30 years ago, was never addressed. The second part of the ADA was the ability for individuals with disability to become economically self-sufficient. Well, you cannot become economically self-sufficient if you are limited to $2,000 in assets. It's just not possible. So Congress realized the short-sightedness of that, and they created the ABLE Act. What it did is it created a new section, Section 529A of the IRS Code. It is modeled after the very successful 529 college savings plan that people have used for 30 years to plan and save for college expenses. This account creates a tax advantage savings program just for individuals with disabilities. Let me make sure that's clear. You must have a disability to have an ABLE account. It is the first product in history that is specifically designated for people with disabilities. These accounts enable individuals to save for their future expenses while protecting their eligibility for public benefits. If you have earnings in the program because of your investment gains, those earnings are tax-free as long as the proceeds are used for qualified disability expenses. Now, I know a lot of you um, have to deal with government and government one loves all loves one thing above all else, and that is an acronym. There's an acronym for everything. Think the FBI, CIA, IRS, you name it, there's an acronym for it. Well, the acronym you need to know for ABLE accounts is QDE, Qualified Disability Expenses. It's the number one thing that people want to know about. It's the number one question that people have. What can I spend this money on? And we're going to talk a lot about that coming up because it's a pretty extensive list of what you can spend the money on. So let's talk nationally. Uh, an ABLE account, in order to be a qualified ABLE account, it must be housed within the state, which is why the state of Michigan is sponsoring our ABLE program. Uh, you couldn't go to a bank or a credit union or a financial institution and say, I want to open an ABLE account. They probably will not know what you're talking about, um, but they have to be sponsored by an individual state. So this is Michigan's program. The rules are you're limited to one per eligible individual which means if you have an ABLE account, you can't open another account somewhere else. You need to stick with one account. If you are unhappy with the ABLE program that you have already enrolled in, you may transfer money uh, from one ABLE program to another. You just have to close that account after the money has been transferred. The account owner of an ABLE account is the designated beneficiary. Let me make sure that's clear. The individual with the disability owns the account. It's their money. However, regardless of who put the money in the account, regardless of how it's funded, the money in the account belongs to the individual with the disability. However, because we have a wide spectrum of abilities in the disability community, we do allow other individuals, we call them authorized legal representatives, to help open and facilitate ABLE accounts on behalf of a disabled person. So if you are the parent, grandparent, spouse, sibling, legal power of attorney, court appointed guardian, or social security administration designated representative payee, you are permitted to be an authorized legal representative on an ABLE account for an individual with a disability. 
Total annual contributions to an ABLE account cannot exceed the federal gift tax limit, which for 2021 is $15,000. That is subject to annual IRS changes. And that $15,000 is regardless of source. So it doesn't matter how the money gets put in the account, $15,000 is the hard cap, unless, unless the individual with a disability is employed and has an income, then at that point in Michigan, that person could contribute an additional $12,880 into their ABLE account. So theoretically, a Michigan resident who is disabled and employed could contribute up to $27,880 this calendar year into their ABLE account. We do allow rollovers from 529 education accounts. However, I just wanna make sure that it's clear that ability to roll that money over does expire in 2025. So if it's something that you're considering, which is part of your financial plan, you may wanna make sure that that gets done in the next few years. I can't tell you what Congress will do in the future. I can tell you that right now it does end in 2025. There are a number of people who open 529 education accounts when their children are young, uh, for instance, before a disability manifests itself. So there is a pool of money that has been transferred from 529 education accounts into 529 ABLE accounts already. Some of the more uh, important aspects of ABLE accounts, ABLE assets are excluded from Medicaid eligibility, which means you no longer have to worry about that $2,000 asset threshold. You no longer have to worry about uh, either spending down money out of uh, someone's assets or taking assets out of someone's name in order to maintain eligibility. You can put that money in an ABLE account. And the, my, excuse me, the Medicaid eligibility is not just for Medicaid, it's for any program that Medicaid determines the eligibility for. So uh, programs like uh, Children's Special Health Care Services, um, the home and community-based waiver programs, any waiver programs like the Traumatic Brain Injury Waiver Program, any of those programs that Medicaid determines the eligibility on, you no longer have to worry about that $2,000 asset threshold. Because of that, Medicaid does reserve the right to claw back any money left in an ABLE account after the beneficiary passes away. That is statutorily allowed, but it is not required. Michigan Medicaid has never made a claim to the remainders of an ABLE account. I can't tell you they won't do that in the future, but I can tell you they have never done that in the past. And in those situations, the money left over in an ABLE account simply becomes part of that beneficiary's uh, estate plan. So if they had a will, if they had a trust, uh, if it went through probate, it just becomes part of their estate and is distributed just like any other financial asset. ABLE assets over $100,000 do count as a resource for SSI. It doesn't change eligibility. You still have the same uh, program eligibility that you had before you hit $100,000 but they will suspend that 700 i think 750 dollar roughly 780 dollar payment that you're entitled to um, a number of people have uh, concerns about losing that source of income and it's really easy to prevent just don't have more than a hundred thousand dollars in your able account again even at fifteen thousand dollars a year it's going to take you a number of years to get to that hundred thousand dollar threshold but again, if you're worried about losing that, that monthly income from SSI, you can simply start spending the money out of the ABLE account. That's what it's there for. That's why you created the program. Who is eligible to open an ABLE 529? Anyone who became disabled prior to age 26. Let me be clear. It does not matter how old the beneficiary is today. It matters how old they were when the disability happened. So if the disability happened at birth, and they're in their 60s or 70s, they are eligible for an ABLE account. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the asterisks in just a second. Again, you're only allowed one ABLE account, so if you have an ABLE account open in any other state, you'd have to close that account to open a Michigan account. There are three ways that you can prove eligibility. You can be eligible for SSI or SSDI because of that disability. You can have a condition listed on the Social Security Administration Compassionate Allowances list 
or you can self-certify with a doctor's note, and a doctor would need to certify that you have a disabling condition that happened before age 26, and it will last for longer than one year. Now, I mentioned earlier that you must have become disabled before age 26 to open an ABLE account. Uh, again, when Congress was debating this bill, they were not trying to help individuals with disabilities only whose disability manifested itself before age 26. They wanted to help the entire disabled population. But because Congress operates the way they, they operate, they limited this to people whose disability happened before age 26. Unfortunately, that left a, a large population out. Uh, individuals who become disabled after age 26 cannot avail themselves of this program. Uh, people who suffer from a traumatic brain injury after age 26 cannot avail themselves of this program, including disabled veterans uh, who ha whose disability happens after age 26. Uh, people who develop a condition later in life like uh, multiple sclerosis, ALS, any of those types of conditions that happen later in life, if they happen after age 26, this program is not available to them. Unless Senate Bill 331 and House Resolution 1219, which have been proposed in 2021 to raise the age of onset from 26 to 46. If that passes, then those people would be considered eligible for ABLE programs. I would love to be able to tell you what Congress is going to do. Um, I think everyone in Congress thinks this is a very good idea. I know in the state of Michigan, this would increase our population of eligible beneficiaries from around 300,000 to around six or 700,000. So it would almost double the potential population. I think it will pass. The question is when. The question is what you know uh, trigger in Congress will allow this to pass. I, I don't have the answer to that yet. Like I said, I think it will pass, and I think Michigan, along with a lot of the other states, will do an aggressive uh, campaign to get those people into the ABLE program uh, because it's important, because they need their benefits, and they need to maintain their eligibility, and they need a way to shelter these assets so that they can maintain that eligibility and save for their disability expenses. I talked earlier about QDE, what can ABLE assets be used for? I'm gonna to talk to you uh, specifically about these uh, right now. Distributions from ABLE accounts must be made for qualified disability expenses, QDE. Those costs are directly related to the beneficiary's blindness or disability. They must be used for the benefit of the person with a disability, which means don't withdraw money from your ABLE account and give it away to somebody else as a gift. That's not for that person's benefit must be for their benefit. Tracking of QDE is a responsibility of the designated beneficiary or their authorized legal representative, whether that's a parent, sibling, spouse, grandparent, power of attorney, all that previous list. Whoever is responsible for helping the person with a disability needs to ensure that these accounts are used for tracking, excuse me, these accounts are used for purchasing qualified disability expenses. Because disability expenses are subject to audit by the IRS and the Social Security Administration, I, I can't tell you what they're looking for because they haven't audited anyone in Michigan yet. I suspect that's only because it's so new. It's such a new product. There will eventually be audits where the IRS is going to ask someone to show how a uh, expense was disability related. And if you're expense is on the next list, you will be just fine. The IRS actually said in the legislation that qualified disability expenses is meant to be interpreted as broadly as possible and includes the expenses of everyday living. So just like you can use your 529 education account to pay for tuition and books and fees, uh, computers, the cost of higher education, you can pay for all of those costs out of an ABLE account as well. Additionally, you can use your ABLE account to pay for housing, uh, rent, mortgage, utilities. Um, you can use it to save for a down payment on a condo or an apartment. You can use it to make modifications to a, to a residence to allow for wheelchair accessibility or to, uh, to create a safer environment. Basically, any form of housing or anything that's going to help with the cost of housing is an allowable expense. You can pay for your property taxes out of an ABLE account. 
one of the key aspects that the disabled population uh, encounters that, that is uh, challenging or problematic is transportation. The statistics are that uh, individuals with disabilities are twice as likely to be underemployed and three times as likely to be unemployed. And a lot of that reason is because they have limited access to transportation. Well, you can now pay for transportation expenses out of your ABLE account. Whether that's an Uber or a bus pass or the purchase of a wheelchair accessible vehicle or the purchase of any type of vehicle. Uh, you can also pay for flights. You can pay for, uh, if you need to take a ferry from, from one, one peninsula of Michigan to the other, you can pay for those transportation costs out of an ABLE account. ABLE accounts can also be used to pay for any healthcare or medical costs. Uh, if you have to go to the doctor's office, if you have to pay for a lab fee, if you have to pay for uh, any diagnostic or, or um, a testing or a, an x-ray or genetic testing or any type of diagnosis fee, uh, you can pay for any and all of those expenses, expenses out of an ABLE account as well. You can pay for employment training programs. Um, it doesn't have to be higher education related. If you wanna take a resume writing class, if you wanna take a creative writing class, if you wanna take a certificate class, it's going to allow you to become an airplane mechanic or, or a, a heating and air conditioning technician. You could pay for those classes out of your ABLE account as well. If an individual with a disability needs assistive technology like an iPad or an e-reader, um, I forgot to mention with healthcare costs, any piece of durable medical equipment is also an allowable expense. Anything that's gonna help an individual with a disability uh, maintain their individual lifestyle, it's an allowable expense out of an ABLE account. If you need to pay for the services of someone to come into the home to pay for cooking, cleaning, uh, bathing, uh, any of the activities of everyday living, you can pay for those services out of an ABLE account as well. If you need to pay for the services of an attorney, or a CPA, or any other type of professional with the administration of a person with a disabilities affairs, you can pay for their services out of an ABLE account. You can also pay for any end of life expenses. The IRS specifically said you no longer need to pay prepay for funeral costs. You can pay for those costs post-mortem, after death, out of the ABLE account. Now, as I mentioned, the IRS has, has deemed that QDE is meant to be as broad as possible and includes the expenses of everyday living, but they also want me to warn you that distributions for non-qualified expenses are subject to tax consequences and may impact eligibility for federal means-tested benefits. What does that mean? It means if it's not on this list, you might want to be hesitant to pay for those things out of your ABLE account. Um, we have a handful of examples of things that we think, yeah, you're probably not going to want to pay for your for your uh, lottery tickets or your, a trip to the casino um, out of your ABLE account. Um, don't pay for things like cigarettes and alcohol with your ABLE account. I'm not saying don't buy those things. I'm not saying don't spend your money on those things. I'm just saying don't spend your ABLE money on those things. Um, use external money. You know, use your everyday spending money for things like that. If you care to. Um, because the last thing I want is for someone to get audited on, on an ABLE expense where they have used it for something they shouldn't have. Uh, another example we like to use is jewelry. You're going to have a hard time justifying to the IRS that a diamond ring or a diamond tiara or a diamond brooch or, or any other type of uh, gemstone is a disability related expense. Now a medical alert bracelet, yeah, you're not going to have a problem telling that to the IRS. Um, a watch that helps someone with, with visual problems tell time, you're not going to have a problem with that. Um, one of the examples that the IRS used that I thought was a very good example is uh, a lot of kids today use their iPhones to help with navigation and to help with scheduling, you know, to set an alarm, things of that nature. That is a great example of a disability related expense. There's a lot of people, for instance, with autism that utilize their iPhones and the services to their iPhones. Uh, to help navigate their day-to-day -day life with their iPhones. So that's a great example, and that's the example that the IRS used of, of a legitimate qualified disability-related expense. So um, 
basically what I want you to understand is if it's on this list and you can make it work on this list, then you will be 100% in compliance with the legislation as the IRS has set forward. And if you have any questions, use other money. Don't use money out of the ABLE account for this for that type of expense. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what Michigan has done to make this program great for Michigan residents. Um, as I said, Michigan was one of the first states in the United States to have an ABLE program. We went live in November of 2016. We were the fifth state in the United States to go live. And the Michigan legislation was really, really generous to Michigan residents because anyone who contributes to an ABLE account can claim up to a $5,000 income tax deduction on their Michigan income tax return and a joint couple can claim up to a $10,000 income tax deduction on their Michigan income tax return. Remember that's a Michigan income tax deduction, not a federal income tax deduction. Michigan also increased its 529 limit to one of the highest in the nation. You could theoretically shelter up to $500,000 or a half a million dollars in the ABLE program in Michigan. Now, again, at $15,000 per year cap, it's going to take you a number of years to get to that, but if you have means and you have the ability to save that kind of money, you could shelter a half million dollars in our program. Michigan offers five different investment options. They range in um, risk and they range in cost, but all of our investment costs are under 1%. We have a program management fee that's a half a percent, and we charge a $45 annual fee. All of our fees are taken quarterly out of the deposits that you've made to an ABLE account, so you're not going to get an invoice or a bill or anything from me. We do allow individuals to make investment changes twice per calendar year. So if you decide that uh, you know the stock market is really booming and you wanna put more money into the stock market, you can make those twice per year. But moving money from the investment account to cash for distribution does not constitute an investment change. In addition to our five investment options, we also have an FDIC insured money market option that does have an optional debit card. It's a Visa card that's accepted anywhere Visa is accepted. Um, and it makes it really easy to track your qualified disability expenses. You get a quarterly statement through the email that says where you spent the money you know was it at a you know a, a Rite Aid pharmacy or did you spend money on you know transportation all of those uh, types of uh, information are available on your quarterly statement in addition to those options we also have the ability to enroll your investment counselor in our ABLE program so that you can make investment decisions based on your individual investment profile and your risk tolerance. So if you wanna do like, for instance, I only want to invest in Michigan companies, or I only want to invest in, in companies that have a, uh, a green component or a, a, an environmental component, or you wanted to invest in minority owned businesses or something along those lines, we do have the ability and the flexibility to enroll your investment counselor in our program and have him or her create your investment profile for you if you so choose. As I mentioned, um, the money market FDIC insured option does come with a Visa debit card that can be used anywhere Visa is accepted. I wanna talk a little bit about our customer service team. Our customer service line is 844-656-7225. They're available Monday through Friday to help individuals navigate our uh, website, which I'm going to show you momentarily. They are available to help make contributions and withdrawals to answer questions about the program and, and some of the benefits that you might seek. One thing I do want to warn you is they cannot give investment advice. They will not tell you which of the five investments you should be in. Um, they're not stockbrokers or investment counselors. That's not the type of advice that they're there to provide, but they can help you navigate the system and ensure that if you make a deposit, that it gets credited to the correct account, things of that nature. I mentioned earlier, all of the information that I'm providing is available on our website at www.myable.org. Um, in addition to the presentation that you're seeing, there's also webinars and eligibility uh, quizzes so that you can determine if in fact your, uh, your family member or yourself are eligible to enroll. And all of our enrollment information is available there as well. 
Um, so you can take a look at our disclosure statements, the prospectuses for the, for the various investments, things of that nature are all available on our website. So a lot of people ask me, um, if I have a special needs trust, do I need an ABLE account? Or since I already have an ABLE, need, or an ABLE account, I don't need a special needs trust, right? I am not here to, to, to tout an ABLE account as a replacement for a special needs trust. There are still things that a special needs trust can handle that I cannot handle. Um, I can't handle anything other than $15,000 a year. I can't handle uh, property or businesses, things of that nature. Um, but we are talking about an ABLE account as another tool in the tool belt. Another way to help individuals with disabilities become more economically self-sufficient. There are some advantages to ABLE accounts, as I've mentioned. They're cost-effective. They're you know, roughly $50 per year. You have broader spending power. You can use it on things like housing and transportation and education, um, things that would be difficult to use for a special needs trust. You have easy online account access. Like I said, I'm going to show you that in a second. You can actually go in and look at your account anytime you want, look at your investments, and make changes to those investments. Um, there's a stat state tax deduction for viable contributions, which really helps encourage friends, family, you know, teachers um, to make contributions. I know a number of families that I've talked to have had family members say, you know, I'd really like to help. You know, I, I'm I'm helping fund you know, your daughter's college tuition, what can I do to help your, your son who happens to have a disability? And a lot of families say nothing, because if you give him money, he's going to lose his benefits. Here's a place where friends and family can make a contribution to help defray some of the, what can be extravagant costs of a disability, and you don't have to worry about losing eligibility. Some other advantages to an ABLE account, you don't have to worry about filing any federal taxes on earnings or, or any types of uh, different tax returns that you have to file. But the most important aspect and the thing that we're really, really pushing on this population is that an ABLE account can be an individual with a disability's first step into securing their own financial self-sufficiency. They can be established, administered, and owned by an individual with a disability. So it can be their first step into planning for their financial future. I'm gonna take a drink real fast, then I'm gonna talk about the ABLE uh, platform that we use so that you can kind of get a feel for what it looks like and how to navigate our system. Okay, so when you first come into www.myable.org, you're going to see a screen that looks very much like this. And I'm going to talk a little bit about all the different aspects of this. Um, why my ABLE simply just uh, gives a description of why you might want to, to open an ABLE account. Account holders talks about our different investment opportunities. Um, you can make modifications to your investments, things of that nature there. Give a gift, I'm going to talk about in a second. It's a really cool program I'm really excited about. Contact us, obviously takes you to our customer care uh, customer service center where you can talk with a person about either opening an account or um, account navigation. Across the bottom, we have you, you can check the eligibility, so we can take we can give you an eligibility quiz to determine yes, you are in fact eligible for an able account. Uh, we have all of our FAQs, our frequently asked questions, are across the bottom. Uh, we also have links to all of our webinars and our other events that we have hosted in the past where you can actually hear and see uh, the same type of interaction in a, uh, in a group setting. Okay, so let's assume that I have done my job exceedingly well and you are ready to open an ABLE account. Across the top, you have login, you have open, and you have contact. So you click on open an account, and the first thing that we have you do is take an eligibility quiz to ensure you are in fact eligible for an ABLE account. Uh, we ask you some very basic questions. Are you opening the account for yourself? Do you have a disability that's going to last longer than a year? Did the disability happen before age 26? All of the general questions. And assuming you answer the questions and are in fact eligible, the first thing we ask you to do is to create a username and password. Um, next, we will ask you what is your relationship to the person with a disability? Are you that person or are you a 
family member? Are you a spouse, sibling, grandparent? Do you have power of attorney? Those types of questions to ensure that you are in fact the correct party. The next few slides I'm gonna go through relatively quickly because at the end of the day, this is a financial transaction. This is you essentially opening up an investment account with the state of Michigan through the ABLE program. So we are going to need a lot of demographic information. We are going to need your name. We are going to need your date of birth, your social security number, your addresses, your phone numbers, your contact information so that we can get in touch with you when and if we open an account or if we have uh, other questions for you. Uh, we have to go through the same identity theft and Patriot Act checks that any other financial institution has to go through. So if you were to open up a, an investment account with Robinhood, or if you were to open up an investment account at Fidelity or any of the other you know, uh, organizations that, that handle investments, you're gonna have to provide the same sort of information to us that you provide to them. Uh, it's, we have to go through the same checks that any other financial institution has to go through. We always ask for electronic delivery of documents. Let's face it, it's 2021. Most people get their uh, bank and investment statements electronically as opposed to through the snail mail. Uh, it makes it easier, it makes it faster, and it makes it more cost effective for all of us. One of the other features that ABLE accounts have is the ability to create an authorized signer. As I mentioned earlier, parent, grandparent, sibling, spouse can all be listed on behalf of an individual with a disability. So it makes it really great when you have both a mom and dad who want access to the account, or let's pretend mom and dad are starting to get older and we now need to add a sibling or an aunt or an uncle to the account. That's where you can add an authorized signer so that we have that continuity of control when, it's not an if, it's a when, when someone passes away, we have the ability to ensure that someone else maintains access to the account. So that's a great way to ensure that. This is our investment allocation slide. As I mentioned earlier, we have five different investment options that are available to you. And again, they range from very aggressive, 100% of the stock market to very conservative, only 20% of the stock market. There are some cash components and some bonds. It's actually some real estate components with those as well. But what I did not mention is that you don't have to just choose one. If your particular investment risk tolerance says, you know what, I'd rather spread my money out among those five different investments, you can do that. Or if you wanna spread them out among three different investments, or you just wanna put it all into one investment, you're allowed to do that. So there's, there's a lot of flexibility with this program that allows you to invest based on your personal risk tolerance. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, depending on the market, depending on your particular investment tolerance, you can make modifications to your deposited money twice per calendar year. Um, makes it really easy for you to say, you know what, the market did really well, I wanna put some more money in that, or the market didn't do so well, I wanna take some money out of that and put it into a more conservative investment. You have that ability to do twice per calendar year. So I mentioned earlier the uh, Give a Gift campaign. Um, this is something really, really cool. It is completely optional, you are not required to do this, uh, but it is something that a lot of people have availed themselves of, I'm gonna show you in a second. It is the ability to create a public profile to allow individuals to help crowdfund their ABLE account. So you have the ability to create a profile to tell your story, to, to post a picture, and to, to help give people an understanding of what living with your particular disability costs to, to explain to people, I have to buy a wheelchair accessible van that's going to cost me you know, $78,000, would you consider making a contribution? Or I have a ramp uh, in my house that was built 30 years ago that needs repairs. Would you consider making a contribution? It's a great way to solicit donations um, and to help people uh, build their assets. Um, because once again, for far too long, we have been, we've told these people, I'm sorry, I can't give you any money because if I do, you lose your eligibility. And, and for lack of a better term, and to sound like a third grader, that's not fair. And it's time that we give this population a, a way to become economically self-sufficient. So here's a great way to do it um, through charitable means. 
So we've created these donation profiles. And when I say we, I mean the individuals on the accounts. This is their creation. They have a chance to put their picture up, whatever picture they want. They have a chance to tell their story and, and to give a little insight into what it's like to live with and and and, and deal with a, a lifelong, in some cases, disabling condition. Um, and it's really easy to do. Once you have, uh, you can scroll through all of the profiles. There are thousands of them, so it may take you a while to look through them all. Um, or you can search, so you can search by name and you can say, I, I'm looking for you know, a friend of mine or I'm looking for somebody whose story I heard. You can simply type their name in and see if they have a public profile. But once you find the person, it's really easy to do. All you have to do is click on their name. It pulls up their profile. It tells you how you can make a contribution. On the left-hand side, we can take a bank contribution right from your checking account or savings account through ACH. On the right-hand side, you have the ability to click get a coupon. And what that does is it actually prints an invoice, for lack of a better term, where you can send a check to our uh, processing center and make a contribution to their ABLE account directly from your checking account. Uh, it's a really great way to help facilitate you know, paying for these expenses of a disability. Um, because let's face it, living with a disability can be expensive. It can be more expensive than college. That's how, because it's a lifelong expense. So this is a great opportunity to help those people who have, for lack of a better term, been unhelpable um, since the ABLE account was established. You know, we've, we've told this population that you can't save money. You can't plan for your financial future. You can't save for your expenses. And now they have ability to do so. And now it's a great time for us to, uh, to help them through this crowdfunding aspect as well. Okay, I'm gonna open it up now for questions and answers, but before I do that, I'm gonna scroll one more page so that you guys have access to my email address. Um, I think Courtney will attest that is my email address. I'm, I'm the one who answers that email, and I am always looking for presentations like this. As much as I appreciate the ARC, the ARC is just one group, and I am servicing the entire disabled population. So I am always looking for events, uh, virtual at this point, at least for the foreseeable future, um, where I can talk about ABLE, where, where I can find people who don't mind listening to me for 35 or 40 minutes, explain the ABLE program and, uh, and try and build the, uh, the assets of the program. So I'm gonna go back to my questions and answer slide now, and I'm gonna open it up and let you guys talk for a little bit. Thank you, Scott. We do have some questions. Um, our first set of questions are about items. Um, are they or are they not qualified disability expenses? So uh, yeah, recreation. Gonna, well, sure, while I'm uh, preparing for that question, or why don't you go ahead and read them, I'm gonna go back to the disability expense slide and we'll talk about them. Go right ahead. Okay, recreation. Recreation is a great question. Um, let's, I'm gonna give you two examples, okay? And this is the example that I always get, the question I always get is, can we go to Disney World? The answer is a qualified yes. You could use your ABLE account to go to Disney World because we're in Michigan and Disney World is in Florida, which means it's going to cost something to get you there. You are going to have to be transported there. So if you have to pay for a flight, that's an allowable expense. Transportation is an allowable expense. And assuming you're gonna spend more than one day there, you're gonna to have to get a hotel or someplace to stay that's going to provide housing. That also is an allowable expense. And once again, it is an allowable expense for the person with a disability, not for the family members, not for everybody who goes on the trip, but for the person with a disability. The next question that I get when I mention that is, what if we have to pay someone to come assist? someone to provide personal support services. Those are 100% allowable expenses out of an ABLE account as well, which is why I pulled up the screen. So the answer to the question on recreation is a qualified yes. That is an allowable expense. Here's what I would hesitant, be hesitant to spend my money on for recreation. Um, I would be hesitant to pay for the, the entry costs into Disney World with my ABLE account. 
because the IRS may say, you know what, that's not a disability expense. Um, on the flip side of that, there are a number of camps that specialize in um, recreation for uh, people who are in wheelchairs or people who share a specific condition. Um, those camps are 100% absolutely allowable to be paid for out of an ABLE account because they are, by definition, disability related. So again, the applicability of whether a particular um, expense is a disability related expense is ultimately up to the IRS. My advice to everyone that I talk to is if it falls neatly onto this list of these 10 or 12 different conditions, you'll be just fine. If you have to make a case for something, then maybe you'd be better off spending money outside of ABLE on that particular thing. So I hope that helped. Um, so the answer to recreation is sort of. How about that? Okay. Now what about recreation like movie tickets or cable internet? Absolutely. Cable internet is an easy one because that's a utility. That's a cost of housing. So that is absolutely an allowable expense. Um, movie, I mean, the legislation says that it includes the expenses of everyday living. So here's my advice. I wouldn't use this account to pay for a, a five or $10 movie. I would use this account to pay for um, a wheelchair ramp or, you know, a, a big ticket item. I wouldn't use, I mean, at $50 a year, you don't want to use this account like your bank account. You want to use this for long-term savings. You want to lose, use this for long-term investing. I wouldn't use this for those daily expenses. I wouldn't use this to pay for my groceries. I would use other money for that. I would use this as an investment account to grow for future expenses. That's my advice. The question that you asked was, could I use this for things like movies? The answer is, I don't see anything that prevents it from being used for movies, but that's not how I would use it, okay? All right, one more question about qualified expenses. Yep. Um, thinking about a companion dog and the expenses that might go along with that, is that covered? Absolutely. Um, we would classify that under assistive technology or healthcare or medical costs. Um, the bottom line is a, a service animal, it doesn't even have to be a dog, it could be any type of service animal that has um, some sort of special uh, training or some sort of um, attribute that, that makes it um, related to a disability. That's absolutely an allowable expense. Not only the cost of the animal, but any veterinary care associated to it, any food, any, any other type of special costs related to that service animal are allowable expenses as well. So if you have to have a particularly uh, a special leash or, or anything like that, those are allowable expenses as well, absolutely. We did have a question about, is this being recorded? And I just like to say, yes, it is. And it will be available on the ARC Michigan website um, probably early next week. All right, okay. next set of questions um, have to do with funding the um, okay. ABLE account. So are MESP rollovers included um, in that annual $15,000 limit? Um. I'm gonna change the wording of the question a little bit. The answer okay. is yes. So if you were to say, I've got money in my MESP, I wanna put it in an ABLE account, that is subject to the $15,000 per year cap. So if you did that on January 1st, you would not be able to contribute any more money into the ABLE account. And let me, let me speak, expand on that a little bit. That is one of the shortcomings that Congress is attempting to address. Um, because there are a lot of people, there's literally hundreds of billions of dollars in 529 education accounts. Some of it is not going to be able to be used because these individuals are not gonna go on to higher education because they have a disability. So the, the, we understand that people wanna move that money from 529 education accounts into 529 ABLE accounts where they have more flexibility. And I believe that eventually there will be some sort of waiver that will say, you know what, we're not going to we're not going to cap 
that or count that as part of your $15,000 annual cap. I believe that's where it will end up. It's just not there yet. The other situation that we encounter quite often is individuals who receive a settlement. Uh, you know, maybe they were injured in a car accident and that car accident was a disabling condition. It happened before they were age 26 and now they're, they're receiving benefits because of the disability and they get a lump settlement of $100,000. Well, as I mentioned, I can only help them with $15,000. So now they've got $85,000 that they need to do something with or they're gonna lose the benefits that they need because of the accident that caused them to need the benefits. So it's one of those things where it's kind of a, a catch-22 situation. Congress, once again, understands that there are a number of people that have, that have fallen into this category. I believe they will be addressing it soon. I just don't know when. Um, the third example that I use, in addition to, to those two, is those individuals who have been declined, for lack of a better term, <coughs> by the Social Security Administration, and then the Social Security Administration um, changes their designation, agrees that yes, they are in fact disabled, and then sends them a check for thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars in back pay, and then tells them you have 18 months to spend this money, or you're going to wait for it, lose your eligibility again. Um, that's another situation that I think Congress realizes. Yeah, we need to address that. We need to be able to allow these people to put that lump sum of money into an ABLE account without penalty so that they can use this money for what it's intended for, their disability expenses. So we're not there yet. Again, it's a it's a function of how new our program is. We're only we're less than five years old. And I think it will eventually get to the point where Congress will realize hey, we need to allow people to put lump sums in these situations, lawsuits, um, back pay from Social Security, those kinds of things. I think it will happen eventually. But for right now, yes, if you were to try and contribute more than $15,000 in a rollover from a 529 education, it would be prevented. Really long answer, sorry. Thank you for that. So um, you talked about the maximums. Is there any minimums? So we ask when individuals enroll in our program to make a minimum contribution of $25, but we are not going to chase you down for $25. So um, it's really easy to set up contributions. Um, we can we can enroll your bank into a into a situation where money just gets contributed on a regular basis. You can set it up for as little as you want, up to, excuse me, from $25 on up. Um, many of the people in our portfolio just make regular contributions and they're using this account like an investment account. They are planning for their long-term expenses. They know that they're going to need money at some point in the future for some sort of disability related expense and they wanna have this money available to them when they need it. Um, as of this morning, we have 5,942 accounts opened, and we have $29,074,135.41 on deposit. So these accounts are being used. People are saving money. People have sheltered $29 million that is no longer subject to spend down. It is no longer subject to people losing their Medicaid or other waiver program eligibility because of these assets being in their name. So it is working, it is doing what exactly we intended it to do. We just need help building the program. I mentioned earlier that we have about 6,000 accounts open. We have about 300,000 people in the state of Michigan who are eligible. So we're at like 2% of our potential population. And again, if they raise the age of onset from 26 to 46, we're at less than 1% of our potential population. So I'm here to help get the word out, to explain to individuals with disabilities and their families how they can save for their future expenses without jeopardizing their eligibility for the public benefits that they need. Earlier you had mentioned the ability for the individual to make an investment advisor uh, choices related to, you know, like environmentally conscious or Michigan specific. Sure. Um, 
Is this in addition to the diversified portfolios or something separate? It's something completely separate. So, and it, and again, it's not a requirement that you put all your money in with your investment in counselor. If you like some of our investment options, you can use those and you can also have an investment counselor make some investments on your behalf as well. We intentionally want to make this as flexible as possible. We understand that this population has never had a product like this. So our investment, uh, our five core investment options are relatively simple, rudimentary, um, just to make them easy. But if you want to do some more complex investing, um, that's the investment advisor option is the way for you to go and do that. All right, a couple of questions on the same topic here. Upon the owner's death, the state is a creditor, correct? Creditor is a tough word, um, but the answer to the question is yes. Medicaid is statutorily allowed to claim the money that's left in an ABLE account. They have never done it, but they are allowed to do it. Um, and let, let's be perfectly honest, this is the number one consideration that people are like, well, I'm not putting money into an ABLE account with that provision. And I completely understand that. And I can completely justify that position. Um, it, it, it really harms the, what's the word I want to, the, it's not the credibility, but the bottom line is people don't like that. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, Michigan Medicaid has never made a claim to what's left but they could in the future they they could change that policy um if today let's let let's pretend for instance that someone uh with an able account passes away today and michigan medicaid does not make a claim then it simply becomes part of that person's estate and it goes through the normal airship process just like anyone any other financial asset just like a 401k or a bank account or anything like that um, so the answer to the question is yes, the state of Michigan Medicaid eligible, excuse me, Medicaid office is a creditor, but they have never made a claim to what's left. Thank you. Um, can you explain the $500,000 cap that's unique to Michigan? Sure, sure. Um, so every state has the ability to determine its 529 limit. So if you take ABLE off the table, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. If you take ABLE out of the out of the conversation, um, if you were to save in, in a 529 education account and you reach $500,000 in that account, you, you save you know, voraciously for 15 years and you finally have a half a million dollars in your account, State of Michigan says you can no longer contribute to that account. It's, it's full, basically. So that's what the cap means you have a, a limit of five hundred thousand dollars in michigan where you can contribute up to a five in a 529 once you reach that limit you can no longer make contributions now if you were to withdraw money and then be under that five hundred thousand dollar cap you can now contribute money so the numbers that you need to know for able accounts are number one fifteen thousand dollars per year number two one hundred thousand dollars is the limit where ssi uh, does not count as a resource. And in the state of Michigan, $500,000 is the cap for any 529 contribution. Once you've reached that cap, you can no longer contribute. Thank you so much, Scott. If people have follow-up questions, um, your email address is on the handouts and has been shared in the chat. Um, yep. That's it for yep. questions for today. Let me just clarify, if you have questions about your particular ABLE account or account access, please go to customer service. I'm not gonna be able to help you with that. If you have questions about policy, if you have questions about uh, virtual presentations, please feel free to email me at myable at michigan.gov. Thank you so much, Scott. And, and thank you to everybody who joined us today. Um, these policy seminars have been uh, really informative. And I think um, one of the, the benefits of um, 
our learning over the last year has been about this, this, these virtual technologies that we can um, share information through and, and broaden our audience. So thank you for joining us today. And we hope that you will join us um, next Friday at the same time at 10 o'clock for our next topic. Thank you so much, everyone.